dozen Covenant Superior battleships against a single Halcyon class cruiser. With those odds, I'm content with three. Make that four kills. It's durable, reliable, and a true ship of the line. It's also the very first thing we see from the Halo universe. What's up, meta nerds, and welcome to our very first non Star Wars lore video. Starting with the first ship we see, the Halcyon class light cruiser. A ship well known for its staying power and served as a mainline cruiser for much of the Human Covenant War. We'll be doing a size comparison and breaking down its stats, as well as covering this ship's venerable service history. The Halcyon class cruiser, or as the Covenant referred to it, the Human Attack Ship Class II, was first introduced to the UNSC in 2507, 18 years before the start of the Human Covenant War. It was designed by Dr. Robert McLees of Ray's McLees Shipyards, being actually constructed on their facilities over on Mars, which manufactured most of humanity's fleets. The Halcyon has a length of 1,170 meters or 3,840 feet, a width of 352 meters or 1,155 feet, and a height of 414 meters or 1,359 feet. While never the largest ship in the UNSC Navy, and it was dwarfed by the Covenant supercarriers in humanity's own infinity, it's still larger than any ship we've ever built, being longer than three and a half Nimitz-class carriers, or about the length of 115 Scorpion battle tanks. It was as wide as 47 Banshees, or two Zumwalt-class destroyers laid across. And that total height is just 100 feet shorter than the Empire State Building, and taller than 11 Scarabs stacked on top of each other. The Halcyon was unshielded, like almost every UNSC ship, where the opposite is true for the Covenant Navy. As you might expect, this lack of shielding was a common weakness for the UNSC ships until the end of the war. Due to this lack of shields, UNSC ships relied on heavy armor plating and clever engineering to improve their durability. The Halcyon was protected by Titanium A armor plating, which could absorb several shots from ship-based plasma torpedoes. But its most notable feature, and the true source of its durability, was its unique internal structure. Its decks were latticed with internal cross bracings to create a honeycomb-like appearance. These reinforced decks allowed the ship to remain intact and combat ready even when sustaining breaches to each of its compartments, and up to 90% of its outer armor could be damaged without the ship failing. For sublight transport, the ship came equipped with three Mark II Hanley Masser fusion drives, as well as the UNSC standard Shaw Fujikawa Translight engine for slipspace travel, used for when you're traveling many light years. Human slipspace speeds were also much slower than their Covenant counterparts, and often led to escaping human ships being caught in an ambush by pursuing alien fleets. We made a blind jump. How did they- Get here first? The Covenant ships have always been faster. If they know where they were jumping to, they could easily reach the fleeing ship's destination before them. This very tactic was used by Thel Vadami, later known as the Arbiter, in command of the Fleet of Particular Justice during the battle over the newly discovered Halo, with the Pillar of Autumn being commanded by Captain Keyes and the ship's AI, Cortana. As for armaments, it, like most of humanity's navy, relied heavily on ship-to-ship -ship Archer missile pods, six in total, as well as four Shiva-class nuclear warheads, for when more explosive power was needed. It also had 40 M910 point defense guns to shoot down any frisky Covenant fighters. But when it really needed to lay down the firepower, the Halcyon had its massive, spinally mounted Magnetic Accelerator Cannon, or MAC gun, which could take out smaller Covenant ships with a single well-placed hit, and essentially made this entire ship into one giant gun. Because these ships were built before the first contact with the Covenant, when they did eventually encounter them and this superior alien technology, the UNSC soon discovered that massive refits were necessary, as these ships were only designed to combat insurgent rebellions, not take on the plasma weaponry and shields of the Covenant Warfleet. Though it should be noted that even when combating unshielded human ships, at this time it was still considered weakly armed for its size. To make up for these insufficiencies, Halcyons like the Pillar of Autumn had a complete overhaul of their armament. Having 18 M910 point defense guns, 6 M66 Sentry autocannon turrets, 8 Mark 33 Spitfire coil gun batteries, of course it kept that powerful Mac gun, down to one Shiva-class nuclear warhead, but adding three Havoc tactical nuclear weapons, and 32 of those Archer missile pods, which would be a total of 832 missiles on board. Though it should be noted that Captain Keyes once did an inspection of the Autumn, counting Archer missile pods 30 across and 10 down, with each of them holding dozens of missiles, which means it had at least 7,200 missiles on board. Why there's this discrepancy is unclear, but perhaps it hints at the UNSC's official stats being off in order to throw off the enemy, and maybe we should trust the actual words spoken by Captain Keyes. Let me know what you think. And something to note here is that many of the Halcyon's auxiliary weapons look very similar. This is due to the fact that each of these weapon systems, aside from the missiles, are actually all either coil guns or rail guns, relying on magnetically accelerated projectiles to cause their damage. Something that works particularly well when firing in space, without that wind resistance and drag pulling down your shots. 
The differences between these guns comes from their size and ammunition, which of course dictated the roles that they would perform. With the larger Spitfire coil guns supplementing the main Mac, and the smaller M910s to try and swat away any boarding parties. All this firepower came at a significant cost to weight, making the ship a hefty 9 million metric tons, one third of which comes from that heavy armor plating. Titanium is a very light metal for its strength, so just imagine how strong 3 million metric tons of titanium plating is. By the way, that makes the overall weight of this ship equal to 90,000 Blue Whales, or 102 Nimitz class carriers. And some figures put the total amount of titanium on Earth at 2 billion tons, which means that every Halcyon takes up about 0.0015 of Earth's total titanium reserves. But they're also harvesting asteroids and building this thing on Mars. While this ship was adept at naval combat, it also found itself as a carrier for both strike craft and ground assaults. It was crewed by 1,000 naval personnel, which were assisted by a shipboard AI that could perform a variety of functions, from navigation to firing the main Mac gun. Just below that massive main cannon we can see the bridge, as well as the planetary scanners used to coordinate any ground assaults, info that would be relayed to its large onboard complement of troops and vehicles. Across its eight docking bays were an array of five longsword fighters, two albatross troop carriers, 12 pelican dropships, 20 scorpion battle tanks, and 60 Warthog Force application vehicles, each manned by either the 800 onboard marines, or sometimes the 400 more elite ODSTs, the latter of which could be deployed from orbit via the 216 drop pods on board. While this ship certainly sounds impressive, we have to remember that it was designed during the insurrection, before humanity had to deal with Covenant energy weapons and shields, and even then it was actually regarded as a lackluster, if admittedly hard to take down warship. The refits to its armament managed to make it more competitive with other ships of its time, but poor maneuverability, speed, and increased malfunctioning and maintenance costs on account of the signature honeycomb-like interior meant that it was soon replaced by the newer, more wartime-appropriate Marathon-class cruiser. After the war, both of these ships would inspire the Autumn-class cruiser, taking its name from the most famous Halcyon ship. The Pillar of Autumn was of course infamous among the Covenant for transporting the demon Master Chief and Cortana to the first Halo ring. Not long after the station's discovery, the Pillar of Autumn would be used by Chief to destroy the Halo by overloading its enormous main reactors. This caused a massive explosion that took out the ship, Halo, and the remaining Covenant fleet. And though maintenance crews may have complained about it, it was that honeycomb-like interior which kept the Autumn intact, and made sure the reactors were functional enough even after losing a lengthy battle and making an emergency landing on the surface of Halo. It may have been considered a decade too old, simple, and often outgunned, looked down on even by ship AIs, but when it counted, the Halcyon always found a way to pull through, just like the humans who built it. So that's it for its history and breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. What makes this a great choice for the first Halo video, is that it's much like the CR-90 from Star Wars, being the very first ship that we ever see in this universe. The name Halcyon comes from Greek, meaning idyllic or happier past, and it's where you get the phrase Halcyon days. And so it's a cool reference to the fact that while humanity may have thought it was in tough times fighting all these insurrections, those were much happier days than when they had to face extinction from the Covenant. The ship was designed by Lorraine McLees, influenced both by Halo's MA-5B assault rifle, which was actually designed by her husband Robert. And they say that out-of-universe inspiration comes from designs in Mobile Suit Gundam. This husband and wife duo would also lend their names to the in-universe designers Dr. Robert McLees and the important shipyard Ray's McLees. Ray's being Lorraine's middle name which is a pretty neat way to tie yourself into the canon, creating a ship that two decades later is still one of the most iconic designs in Halo. If you want to check them out, here are some of the sources used to make this video. If you want to connect with us on social media, find ways that you can help support this channel for free, or check out our Patreon and PayPal, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, if you can't outgun your opponent, you can always outlast them, and the AI will be with you, always.